Hello, everybody, and welcome to the ASME Dynamic Systems and Control Division podcast. Uh, this is your host, Brian, and today we are very lucky to have, which I think is our first international guest all the way from Sweden. We have today uh, Professor Lars Eriksson, who is a, a professor of vehicular systems in the Department of Vehicular Systems and Linköping University in Sweden where he manages the engine laboratory. <clears throat> His research interests include the modeling, simulation, and control of internal combustion engines for vehicle propulsion, with a focus on downsizing and supercharging concepts for improved fuel efficiency. His foremost contributions were to engine control and the control-oriented modeling of combustion engines. He was the first to demonstrate the real-time control of combustion timing using information obtained from the ion current. He is uh, active in academic societies and chairs the IFAC Technical Board Coordinating Committee 7 on Transportation and Vehicular Systems. Uh, he is an associate editor of Control Engineering Practice, and he has served as the adjoint technical editor for several conferences, including IFAC World Congress, Advances in Automotive Control, an Engine and Powertrain Control Simulation and Modeling Conference. Uh, welcome, Lars, and thanks for accepting our invitation. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm very pleased to be here and um, share my thoughts on various topics that you might be interested in. Great to hear. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm glad we were able to manage the, the time differences uh, you were just coming back from class. I am kind of like starting my working day over here. It's, uh, it's great to see that. Yeah, luckily there is some overlap on the working hours. So yeah. We have to make do with the best, with what we've got. Exactly. Doing the best we can with the time we have. Yeah. And so let's start with, um, I, I'm very sure that uh, many of our listeners know you, maybe personally, because you are very active in the societies, but for the listeners who are not familiar with your research, can you tell us a little bit about your latest projects? Uh, taking the history, I've been working very much with the vehicle propulsion um, and uh, uh, doing more and more modeling and doing more and more optimization based uh, strategies to get uh, a structure way of uh, making trade-offs. So NPC-based controls well, has been quite much uh, on the latest part uh, and also developing now the most recent PhD that will be published this year has been to develop an optimal control software that will support everything from modeling and simulation up to open loop uh, optimal control where you can optimize both parameters and uh, also control trajectories so that you can do co-optimization of um, different missions. It's not limited to automotive, it's uh, any generic um, engineering application. So as we said, it's optimal control for the people. That has been one of the most exciting things. I've seen that uh, optimal control is a very useful tool uh, both uh, that aids the designer and also aids the controls engineer and open up the eyes of us as controls engineer of what is possible and getting new insights into things. Then more things that are also, uh, I'm doing too much probably right now. There's so much happening. We're also in, involved in uh, battery and electric machine uh, projects with using battery integrated multi-modular converters for vehicle propulsion applications. Well, um, that's uh, where I am right now. Wow. I, yeah, I, um, I'm looking forward to see the, the tool for optimal control that certainly is going to be very useful for, yeah, as you said, any engineering application. Um, but yeah, um, we have used it. Yeah, we have used it both for investigating uh, some uh, con um, non-trivial control tasks, uh, uh, and has um, yeah, we have been working on it the last like six, seven years, and getting it uh, uh, 
we have showcased a little bit of the application, but it's both for engine control and driveline control and also uh, ship to shore cranes. Mm. Uh, solving the time optimal and energy optimal trajectories of how to lift a container from a container ship to shore and vice versa. The wow. path planning and such things. So it is. Uh, that is very uh, interesting. Um, yeah, huh? I, I think I could I could think of a couple of other applications now in the in my recent projects on the buildings area where uh, we would like to use automated cranes. But of course, you have to optimize not only the energy but the time because crane time yes. is very expensive. So it, it has to be as yeah. quick and safe as you can. Yeah. Um, wow. For the for the cranes, it's not. Um, um, I would say the energy optimal, but and it's not uh, so much of a controls engineer tool. It's more uh, a tool for supporting the sales. What is the theoretical possible? How fast can we move a container from this point to the other point so that uh, the uh, there is a support for the next generation of systems so that they are not claiming too high performance. But, right. Uh, yeah. Otherwise, that that's sense. easy among so the salespeople. They want to sell it, and then it's up to us poor engineers to uh, fulfill this. Yeah. But uh, it, sometimes it's not uh, even theoretical possible with the electric machines we have available, the uh, accelerations, decelerations. Uh, so we can know at least what is theoretically possible. Right. We don't sell anything better than that. Right. We go to the realistic options not just dreaming yes. about super ultra fast cranes yeah very applicable yeah mm -hmm. and as as we've heard yeah you've worked on uh, almost every aspect of vehicle propulsion yeah i yeah you you mentioned before um or, or when we were talking before this interview that you just came from your engine control class now you're working on energy management in electrified vehicles um i know that you've also touch some uh, connected and automated vehicles. So, so which research area of vehicle propulsion do you think will keep uh, the most, will help the most in decarbonizing the transportation sector in the upcoming decades? Um, uh, it's a very big question, and uh, I don't think that there is only one answer. As I said, um, the, some see people say the future is electric while I am saying the future is eclectic. So we have multiple options and we have to consider multiple options. Um, one of the things, of course, that will be a big contributor is the electrification. But what I am uh, also thinking will contribute with is that we do have a big legacy with all the vehicles in on the road. We cannot um, just uh, uh, take away them. We have to, or people want to use them still for many years. So the way of decarbonizing, I believe, is to work on biofuels, but sustainable biofuels that will provide a solid support for those that we have as legacy. Otherwise, it's I would say electromobility is an important part, and then for heavy duty industry, also the hydrogen. Uh, society with either hydrogen for combustion or hydrogen for fuel cell electric. So there, there's a lot of things happening right now. So it's very difficult to say or to bet on a winner. But I do really believe that we should seriously consider how to stop digging up coal from the ground that generates carbon dioxide or additional carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Yeah. If we take it up from the ground, it's um, almost to me irreversible. Of course, there is carbon capture and either wild IDs, but that will cost a lot of money in the end. So stopping digging up carbon from the ground and with carbon is both coal, um, fossil fuels, in, uh, oil and Finally, natural gas. People love natural gas because it's such a big reduction of CO2. But I say I still hate CO2, still hate natural gas because it's 
from the ground. It is not in yet in our circular economy. So right. getting circular is to me the most important thing and everything there we should look at, including electrification, I also believe, including sustainable biofuels. It is not an option to chop down our forests just to replace the hydrocarbons that we have been digging up from ground. We have to really think sustainable. And in this world, I believe controls engineers can contribute with a lot of understanding about feedback mechanisms, about uh, uh, systems engineering that we need to do to get to sustainability. I'm not. Uh, uh, decarbonizing is an important thing, but uh, not only decarbonizing the transport sector, we cannot use electricity from coal. To, electricity from coal is, to me, the worst and dirtiest option. That uh, uh, if I if I were a politician, I would forbid it. Yeah, that is that is true. It's um, um everybody's in the same game of trying different industries trying to decarbonize or at least on the research area. Yeah. And um, yeah, it is it is a good take on um, looking at the life cycle analysis, right? Being circular. And yeah, using all of these feedback mechanisms to understand the stability of, of, a, of a cycle. Right, yeah, say this is doable, this is not doable. Yeah, yeah. yeah. great. And um, I think that uh, there is a lot of possibilities for control engineers to contribute to this development. It's great to hear that, that you have that perspective. We, ex we can still contribute, even though uh, many people have said that some parts of the of the field in transportation are dying, but we can still have our our input there and and improve yeah. things, right? Make things better. Yes. We, Great. We, there is no one revolution. There is no silver bullet. We have to work and we have to navigate through this. But um, yeah, my big cure would be to make sure that we stop digging up things from the ground. That is really what I am aching for that uh, should be done urgently. Yes, I agree. But yeah, uh, that's probably bloody obvious, so to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, even obvious things is hard to hard to get done sometimes. Yeah. So I would like to now um, pick on you on the on your industry experience. So you have been uh, very successful at actually transferring your your knowledge and your the control algorithms you have developed to companies in Sweden like Saab and Volvo. So can you give us some recommendations on how the control community can do this technology transfer more often to industry? That's also uh, um, uh, it's not one silver bullet. You have a lot of tools in your box. But uh, first of all, the thing that I have always been doing is that I've always had collaboration with industry. All my research projects have had an industrial partner involved in the work. So working close to industry makes us understand what are the problems, not just going knocking on their door and ask uh, what research problem do you want to help us solve what they will do is they will look on their desktop or desk and see I need uh, this is what I need now you will get the, the most but really working for a long time together with them then you can see what they're working on and maybe predict a little bit on where the heading is and where is the need where uh, I've sometimes been successful in seeing where the itch will be uh, for uh, the collaborating partners not uh, because I'm um, uh, seeing everything that is done there, but uh, I know a little bit about the models that have been rolling in uh, the academic society and what if, do we need to do to make these available to industry. And one way of working strategically with it is, of course, to have all 
projects have an industrial connection. If there is a PhD student, he has a delivery towards industry, talking to industry, and also continuously getting feedback on directions and so on. And the other mechanism in it is to not only use PhD students, but use project courses and also use master's students. These um, I have a manager at uh, Saab uh, aircraft company here, Saab military aircraft. That is a, that technology is best transferred in a pair of shoes. Great, it's, it's great to hear how you have been building all these partnerships yeah. and it really pays uh, and off. To, yeah. 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 And to continue that, uh, the, sometimes the researcher is so focused on getting the papers published and working on the research and uh, doing deep dive in it. So, and it's not relevant for the thesis or for research uh, publications to do the productification, the um, um, small implementations that make it work in practice. So placing a master thesis student next to the PhD student that is interviewing the PhD student, but is aiming to go to industry or spending time in industry to make it become implemented. So that is also where we have worked uh, quite uh, structured with some of our partners, foremost uh, Scania truck company that they have been we have, and also Volvo cars, we have been placing master students next to PhD students working on the most uh, hot uh, methodological uh, or as a modeling and such things. And then that has evolved into things that they have gotten into their organizations and then been able to uh, transfer into the product. And this, yeah. That, that is a great uh, suggestion to have all of these levels of involvement at different levels of how deep you go in a topic, how wide you go, how implementable. I think that's one of yeah. the lessons I got also from my PhD that um, although it's very important to have this theoretical and, and proof stuff on paper, um, the, the, one of the best gratifications is when you deploy it and it works. Is That feeling is a lot of work, but that feeling is great. And, and yeah. um, I think there is a lot of value in that too, and obviously the technology transfer to yeah. the industry. Yeah. And sometimes it, it the, the um, uh, what do you say, the credit or the feel good feeling doesn't come immediate. But uh, after some years, as me, I've had the opportunity of staying here and people uh, have been able to contact me. So I finished my PhD thesis in 1990 nine and around 2004-2005 I got an email from an engineer at Ferrari that said your PhD thank you for your PhD thesis it was very valuable when we implemented our next generation of uh, ignition control that is awesome <laughs> that is and a great is, story yeah <laughs> Uh, and yeah, being still here is that now I can enjoy the fruits of the things that I did many years ago. All the hard labor, exactly. Yeah, all the hard labor, and yeah, it is it is very rewarding. I yeah, I I I can tell because you are not only very good at you know doing this tech transfer, but you are very good at fundamental research too. And uh, I'm pretty sure that many students in automotive control know this, but you have a book. And I still look back quite frequently when I do my own research. So speaking on that topic, uh, what suggestions do you have for students or early career scientists that might want to write a book on their own? Uh, I uh, didn't myself have that uh, strategy of writing a book. I would say it was an accident in progress. There was uh, when we started a new course here. I had done some research, I written some papers. I worked on understanding like the fundamental principles, and the mod the book should perhaps be titled uh, "Modeling for Control" because the focus is on modeling, and that is where I see the fundamental 
part. So uh, now I'm just talking about how my book came, our book came to be. So we were, had a course to start delivering and there was no course material available. So we started and uh, then that evolved and we, uh, it evolved over, uh, started 1998 writing the first manuscript and then it became a book in 2014 when it was published. So it was, it gathered a lot of material while I hope that the book is good because we have been constantly revising and trying to find what is the essence, what is the fundamental part that we see that our students need for becoming su successful in industry. So it was both the industrial perspective and the academic perspective. And uh, using this bridge then from physics to equations to applications is uh, what I see the most um, important part here. But if the suggestions for how to do it, I believe that do research, understand the fundamental questions. And uh, after a while, when you have collected things that you see that students uh, benefit from, then it's good to write the book because yeah, we had, had our book, I believe, for 12 years before we started the process of thinking uh, to really publish, it was a lecture script. Um, see. But um, for me, I don't have a strategy, it's more collecting the valuable information that students will utilize. And uh, I've been thanked now by, by several, uh, both industrial, engineer says thank you for writing this book It's so great that someone wants to write a book about what we are working on that was from Volvo cars and Volvo trucks um, engineers that said that and then I had the researchers said that yeah, your book is great I I'm using the models that you collected in it's uh, all time in my research and that's also wow. a great uh, yeah uh, it's a great boost for the ego. <laughs> it, it certainly is a great tool. I have used it a lot for mm -hmm. for understanding things and and yeah, for doing my own research. Um, it's a great contribution to the community for sure. Thank you. You're too kind. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm glad we're finishing up with some laughs. Um, so to end on a, on a lighter note, um, and given that. Um, I believe you are our first official international guest, and given that most of the audience is based in the U.S., um, can you tell us some interesting cultural differ differences between uh, Sweden and uh, the U.S.? Yeah, uh, I would say that there's sometimes a collision um, in culture due to that the Swedish people are very literal. Uh, we, uh, uh, you know, uh, when you have to write an, uh, um, well, you have to write a document uh, saying how competent this or that person is uh, mm -hmm. um, in for a thing. And uh, in Sweden, we are, as I said, very literal. We, when we say good, we mean good that it's good you know you, you now know what good is but if you write that in a, um, a document for a, a promotion or something it is more of as a variable for uh, someone who has uh, worked for you then uh, you know that in america you know that good means bad you have to write the best excellent outstanding uh, you have to use this uh, superlatives uh, that um, describe really positive things, but Swedes are very literal. And uh, on the fun note, then this, uh, yeah, if we would, uh, if Swedes doesn't say this is amazing, because uh, that, then it really has to be amazing. <laughs> right. Uh, so one thing then just to show that uh, we're also very blunt when it comes to 
uh, a toilet and the bodily functions. So in Sweden, we say bluntly, I would, yeah, I need to go to the toilet. Or say, even some of my friends uh, could have said, I need to go and take a shit. I, I, I do think that, that here in, in the US, it's it's a lot of kind of like you have to dance around difficult things. Um, yeah. Sometimes it just feels better to to say what you think and just clear the air. <laughs> yeah, um, that comes if you ask uh, a Swede about uh, something. Um, how are things? Uh, you can sometimes uh, get an honest answer, not this. Oh yeah, everything's fine. How are things with you? We don't have that. We tend to answer the question rather right. than just dance around it. So. Yeah, to uh, end on a sad note, I could have said that, yeah, which is true. My father died on Tuesday. Oh, I'm week. so sorry to hear. So, yeah. so I see. Uh, yeah, and then uh, you, we can see on some uh, um, friends that, oh, this was not what they expected to hear. They asked the, the question, but was expecting to hear, and, uh, yeah, everything is fine. How are things with you? But yeah. But the reality is, yeah. Yeah, in, but Swedes are this, uh, we are this kind of difficult people to deal with. I see. Well, yeah. hopefully this conversation cheered you up a little bit. Yeah, it does, um, yeah. Uh, and yeah. hope it, it, you're yeah. looking I forward. Have had, yeah. mm-hmm. I have had my time and I have uh, had my long cries as is necessary uh, for dealing with it. But I have all the wonderful and positive memories with me. And I will also say that I have all the positive connections to all my research friends in the controls community and also in the other engineering communities all over the world. And that's a great support. So I'm so glad to be here and also to share a little bit about the uh, Swedish cultural things to give it maybe a little bit more understanding for how it can come that we are so blunt or uh, it's great deeper. to hear and yeah I, I put it I put that question there precisely because of that because I I understand the differences or I try to at least understand the, dif- the cultural differences that arise so um yeah um thanks for that and uh, yeah hopefully this cheer you up and yeah, I will definitely in, yeah. be seeing you soon, hopefully, so we can catch up in person. And yeah. thanks, thanks for the interview. I'm so thankful for uh, the opportunity that you reached out and that uh, we get an opportunity to also spread the information about the importance of controls in product development and in engineering and in our society. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Lars. Thank you.